Hi everyone and welcome to this latest episode of the Human Factor Security Podcast with me, Jenny Radcliffe, the People Hacker. I am so excited to welcome to the show this week um, a friend of mine and a brilliant writer, Michael F. Shine. Hi Mike, how are you? Hey Jenny, I'm excited to be here. I, I hope we get a chance to talk a little bit about our weird friendship that has emerged very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure. We, well, I mean, there was first of all, this, you know, we're here to talk about the book, and I'm going to talk about it and interview about the book. But when I read the book, I realized why we got on so well straight away because there's just so many things in this that resonated with me apart from the fact that it's brilliant you know yeah. so so I, I feel like we need to kind of talk about it so I have here the hype handbook which uh we're going to put obviously links to all of these things first of all just just briefly tell everyone who, who you are what you do uh, and then we'll talk a bit more about the book yeah so I'm a, a writer at heart and a writer by uh, training and trade however I became an accidental business owner and found that I loved it so I own a marketing agency called Microfame Media and we can talk about how that happened but we, we've worked for some great companies um, the Medici Group which is a fascinating consulting firm United Methodist Publishing House some big tech companies like Magento and LinkedIn and we basically will find a niche and uh, figure out a contrarian point of view for that company and then do a bunch of uh, hyping them up to make them sort of the most visible figure around that idea. And usually in order to drive some business result, like new business. And uh, it turned out I had a talent for it. I did it for my own writing career and then people wanted the marketing as much as they wanted the writing, if not more so. So uh, that's how I became a professional marketer. And, and it is, I mean, one of the things I want to say, Shell, like I say, I just I feel like just leaving it there, like um, like the, like Jimmy Fallon or someone does. <laughs> but um, it's called the hype handbook, but you need to probably clarify to people that that doesn't make it a bad thing, because you say it in the book, you know, people see that, especially at the moment, as a sort of it could be seen as a negative thing. But you're not you're saying that it's not necessarily a negative thing, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons you and I hit it off so very quickly, because I think you've sort of built a career out of taking things and ideas and strategies and tactics that a lot of people have used for negative aims and have said to people, you know what, this stuff is just the way the brain works, the way human beings work, let's use them for good. And I feel like I've done the same. So I mean, typically hype has meant you know, bringing a lot of attention around something that isn't, that there's not much there, like it's all hype. Mm -hmm. And what I define it as is a little bit different. I define hype as any set of activities that drive a lot of attention and a lot of emotion to get people to do what you want them to do. And that might be a terrible thing. And a lot of bad people come to these strategies more easily than good people, but it can be for wonderful things. And, and we can talk about this, but Martin Luther King was a fantastic hype artist. And I see so many people using what I call hype for nefarious ends yes. <laughs> that I decided that it would be really important to dissect this for well-meaning people and put these tools in their hands. I mean, that's what you say. You say, um, and I had, the, I, I've sort of written some of these things down, but you say uh, the most malicious people amongst us tend to have the most intuitive understanding of these principles. I mean, that's, that is so resonant to me. And I'm sure uh, a lot of people, you know, will think about working for managers, you know, that is it the piece of principle, working for managers that haven't got, are not really good at the job or people that we see. I mean, God, it's gone all the way up, arguably, uh, to the top I'm not going to be too specific but you know people yeah, might even sure. say that some of the people yeah. in charge right now have got have not got that substance underneath them so it's really refreshing for you to have gone well you know malicious people see this intuitively what it what you say is what if you actually want to do some good but you just not got that kind of killer instinct to know what to do and that's what you really try and do in the book isn't it it is, and, and I think it's worth drilling down into why the sort of bad people, quote unquote, and sellers of garbage are on balance better at this. And I don't think that it's because 
A, that these strategies are bad or even the killer instinct part. So there's some science behind this. Mm -hmm. They have done, so there's a type of person who, who has a category of, you could call it mental illness or mental state called mm -hmm. antisocial personality disorder. And this is, these are the sociopaths, the psychopaths and, and the narcissists, malignant narcissists. And when they have studied these sort of people and put them under stressful situations, physiologically, their heartbeats and their pulse don't go up as much of, as much as the rest of us. Mm -hmm. So people think that because these kind of people are so good at, at hyping things up and, and quote unquote manipulating, that they must be awful tactics. And, and what it really is, is that they see the world in a cold kind of way. They see the world as a chessboard, right? So while a lot of us will let emotions get in the way, mm -hmm. they just sort of take the action that they coldly know works to get people to do what they want them to do, and often en masse. And what I'm saying is there are ways to train yourself to do the same things, but still be empathetic and still be a decent human being. But I, I don't think it's all about, I think it's, you don't have to turn into a horrible human being to become a great hype artist. You know, I don't want to do reveals of everything in the book of what those strategies are. You have to read the book to find out what those strategies are to get on top of emotion. Um, but it's really true to say that we, there are times when, when you look at things, and I certainly do it from a, a white hat security point of view, and think, well, that's so unfair, or that's so cruel. Um, and like you say in the book, and that's the point, you, you know, you fire off the email or, or you, I think there's, you say something about, you send one text that ruins a year's worth of planning. Right, right. Right. And so it's that distinction that that's so clever, I think, you know. I, um, I, I do a martial art called Wing Chun. It's a type of Kung Fu. And you spend a lot of time in this particular martial art doing exercises that, train you to relax in the face of getting punches thrown at you. And the reason is there are a lot of martial arts that are sports. And, but when people get in a real fight, it goes all out the window. They either just start flailing their arms around and forget everything they learned, or they curl up into a ball. And that's because you can know all of the things you should do or all of the things that can be effective. But if you don't train to calm your nervous system, when things are, are not at stake, then it will inevitably fall apart. So I think, yeah, in, in engaging, this is the last chapter in the book, but engaging in some sort of internal regulation process mm -hmm. is really key to making the other strategies work. And we're getting so ahead of ourselves because people don't even know what the strategies are, but none of them work if you let your emotions get in the way. And this just, I mean, we are getting ahead, we'll, we'll kind of go through it, but this reminds me um, when you say about um, sociopaths, um, <laughs> and it reminds me of that scene. People might know the scene in, in uh, Signs of the Lambs where, where he's talking about Hannibal Lecter and he says he ate, he ate the nurse's tongue or something and he said and his pulse, right. <laughs> and his pulse didn't go, go faster throughout. You know, That's I can't it. remember. Yeah. And, and that reminds me of that. And it also reminds me of um, when I first started learning about emotional intelligence and about emotional um, onset and offset of emotions, talking about a, a, a monk called, who's done a TED talk. He's, he's called Matto Ricard. I probably pronounced that wrong. But Is that he, the happiest man in the, the world? Happiest Is that man. that guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's him. And, yeah. and what people don't know is a lot of the time is that he sat, they, they did an experiment with him where they sat him in a dark room and every now and then they fired like machine guns and things, not at him, behind him, so the noise. And they did the same thing. And just like Hannibal, his heart rate didn't go higher. And that's a great example because the fictional character of Hannibal Lecter is based on real serial killers that are the worst people on the planet. And then this guy is the happiest man in the world. Is the happiest does nothing man. but good. And they have the same internal state. And that doesn't mean you have to become like either of those people. It, it, it's, I'll give one more example. There, there's an example in the book where I talk about the pickup artist community, which is not a group of people that had aged well in term in 2020. <laughs> I mean, these people who like scientifically figure out how to seduce women. However, they are masters in human psychology. And there's a scene in the book, The Game, which sort of exposed mm -hmm. these people where the master seducer is talking to this nerd group that he turns into master seducers. And he goes, listen, 
I have figured out what strategies work to seduce women. You're going to go into the bars and you're going to do what I say, and you're going to feel butterflies. You're going to feel the urge not to approach. You're going to be all these things. Think of them as a pebble in your shoe. Mm. And it's kind of like that. It's like the thing is still there, but you have to train yourself to, to think of it as insignificant, like a pebble in your shoe. And that's what, and you know, and that's what you say. And that's what, that's the difficult part, but what you've done, and you say that at the end, that's the difficult, why are we not all doing this all the time? So just, that's so yeah, I should be, I should be worth a billion dollars because I know this all... stuff like the back of my hand, but my emotions get in the way. Damn my conscience. That's exactly. what I say. But no, <laughs> if we go like, look at it though, what you do is you go through and you say, right, this is how you can make sure that those marketing messages land. This is how you can turn what you're trying to do and use this some of this psychology that we, that we know about and that maybe you didn't understand how it works to change things. So, I mean, let's go through a little bit of it. I mean, I love, love, love your inspiration. This is just, just so good. So the quote, um, you, there have always been people operating on the fringes of respectable society. Talk to me a bit about some of the people who inspired you to write this thing. And I, this is making me smile because remember your question when we first spoke a couple of times ago about punk. <laughs> right. So, so that's what's interesting, right? I mean, a lot of times uh, people want to be straight shooters and climb the ladder, but then their idols are these real boundary breakers, right? So mm -hmm. like rock stars and pirates and, and um, gosh, you know, just David Bowie, right? He didn't play by the rules. So, so for me, I, I, I'm, I've always been this weird combination. I was a, like an A student in school. I put a lot of pressure on myself to do well, God knows why. Uh, looking back, but, um, you know, what wasn't that much of a troublemaker, but I was a mischief maker. And I, I, I would just I'll be the person picking debates with the teachers and this and that. And I got into punk music, as I got a little older and decided to my parents dismay, that I wanted to start a band and change rock and roll, which in retrospect is, is ridiculous. But that's what I did. After college, I went and I, I started a band. And, and looking back, I don't know how much talent I really had. I'm not a particularly great singer, but I was really inspired by these artists, especially musical artists, where the art and the hype were all one and the same, like the Sex Pistols. It wasn't about their guitar stylings. It was about going down the river while the queen was having her jubilee and playing God save the queen, right? Yeah. In my country, that would be like lighting a flag on fire at the, at the you know, presidential yeah. inauguration, I think, right? So mm. um, that stuff always intrigued me. And so we used to get a lot of attention. I mean, I didn't ultimately become a rock star, which is a high bar, but we got on Showtime at the Apollo because I knew we would be booed off and got a bunch of attention through that. Uh, we were on the cover of New York Press. I used to dress as a nun and like walk around the Lower East Side and like lead people onto the stage. We had this song called Ash Wednesday. So, you know, whatever. You said that you, like, that yeah. until you started doing that, not just as a, not just for the state, like you, you just decided that I've got to do this all the time, right? For, for it yeah, make. yeah, yeah. Because um, <laughs> what I realized was I would totally treat the band kind of like theater where like when I was on stage, we would do that stuff. But when I was off stage, I sort of just had clothing that I had. I mean, you know, just flannels from the 90s and a nice shirt from when I was trying to, mm. I don't know, dress up for college. And I just would wear whatever was clean. And so I wasn't, I didn't have a persona. And when I started embodying that persona at all times, throwing the other clothing into the trash, trying to be that rock star, uh, hang out in the right places, our band started to do better. We started to fill up clubs and things. But but you said that it was quite a, a close knit community, with I think which is weird for me because I I was thinking New York is a huge you know a huge place. But then oh, yeah. I, but was it because do you think it was because people saw you in that sort of I was going to say uniform really, which is obviously that what that implies is the opposite. But you know, it, it or was, was or was it that mental? Do you think it was what changed in you or, or was it people's perception of you? Because I think that's an important thing in throughout the book. Is, is yeah. it how you think of yourself as well as 
the way people see the visible size of things that ch- that needs to change. I think that's true. I think you play roles and if you can embody that role. I also think you're hitting on something else, right? That really transferred well into my professional life. This idea of, so New York City is the biggest city in the United States in terms of population. And so you would think, how could you possibly be noticed in New York? And what it turns out is that there are a number of scenes, you know, like there's the downtown rock scene, Mm -hmm. there's the punk rock scene, there's the hip hop scene, and then there's the art scene. And people within those scenes tend to know each other. Mm -hmm. And there's like 40 influencers who control everything. And I realized- Exactly like cybersecurity. It's like cybersecurity. And I found that out in business. I worked in the customer service industry, the call center industry for a while. And that's a multi-billion dollar industry, but everyone knew everyone. All the players knew everyone. And that was that showed me that it's not as hard to become someone who knows someone <laughs> than you would than you would think. Um, so Do you know what, yeah. what's making me laugh about this though is when that wouldn't be true, you would think would be if we think about the internet. Because you would think that that actually is like how does one get noticed on the internet? And this takes us to some of these strategies because this, this, oh God, when I saw this, and there's there's one friend of mine in particular who's just going to love this. So hype strategy number one. Okay, now we're not going to obviously we want people to buy the book and read it, and we're not going to go into that. Please, I mean, you can, you can, and we're not going to get through the whole thing in this interview. (laughs) No, Um, but I, and I've written it down, actually, I've written it down and put it on a post it there over where I can see it. Make war, not love. In other words, right. you advise people, fair strategy, to pick a fight. And who would you go and pick a fight with? Gary V. Mike? Oh. Yeah. Well, so, th- <laughs> so that was the whole thing, right? I mean, the band thing didn't work out. And I yeah. got a corporate job. And you know, I was there for eight years. And I became a straight up kind of guy. Mm-hmm. But then I left. And I became a freelance copywriter and I tried to do things the legitimate way my punk rock side was kind of burned out of me you know over that decade and so I read all the marketing and sales books and this and that none of it worked for me I almost went broke and so then this is exactly what happened I, I I thought back to when I was in the band and about my punk rock heroes and about hip hop hype artists and all this weird stuff I was into mm-hmm. and I was like well why I was really good at marketing back then but I didn't think of it as marketing let me try something like that so I kept seeing Gary Vaynerchuk uh I, do your listeners know who he is is he like a, a player so, it, his, so yeah. some, of, some of them for sure um some of them intimately <laughs> yeah. because, because you you as well you can't avoid it if you're if you're online you can't avoid it really I think yeah so so like he he in that space, right, in my space, in, in content, as they call it, you know, a content marketing, mm-hmm. social media marketing, he was, um, and, and that was my space because I was writing content for digital media. He was going around telling everybody that they should work around the clock and, and hustle and tweet from the toilet. And that's the only way to become successful on social media. And I just thought it was bad advice. He had all these young followers and they were like, doing this, but none of them were getting rich. And Gary kept getting richer and richer. And, and so I wrote an article called Why Gary Vaynerchuk is Flat Out Wrong. And I, I uh, put it on Inc, which I, I was able to, um, I, a friend of mine had hooked me up with that column. And that night, Gary responded to me by video. And mind you, I was a nobody at this time. I mean, this was 10 years ago and I, I, I was like struggling. And he just lambasted me for like 30 minutes. You can find the video. But you and think I thought my be- career was over. But huh? you think that's because, see, I feel like he's not, I think some of what Gary V says, it, it's, it's got, I mean, the idea that you've got to work really hard and you shouldn't just expect things to come to you. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's a solid thing to teach people. I mean, you know, you need feet to walk. I mean, clouds go through the sky. I, I mean, that's not, you know, I mean, <laughs> okay. I mean, what? yeah. Uh, but you know why I say that? Why I say, because I've heard other gurus who sell formulas to people okay, and things. And, 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 and I feel yeah. like he doesn't so much do that. No. But then you realize this massive entourage following him, 
you know, he has the camera. He has, the, I mean, he, he's made a celebrity of his camera guy that follows everything. So I know him. Know, I, I knew him before he was D Rock. I actually knew him before. I, he was my uh, first employee's business partner when they were young. Mm. Uh, and then he was like, I got a job for Gary Vaynerchuk. And before long, he was a star. So anyway, that's just a side note. Yeah. But, <laughs> but like, I do know, I mean, if people don't, we will flash up lots of screenshots and things of Gary V. But, um, but I've seen him talk about like going to car boot sales and things and, 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 and putting stuff on eBay. And I kind of like half of it, I see, I see it. And I mean, and I can see, I guess what I'm saying she is, I can see why it's so potent. So can I. But I can also see that he doesn't like someone. He, he, he doesn't welcome criticism. Like when he yeah. when he answers, I see kids and things like really young kids sometimes on Instagram and stuff asking questions. And one one girl said, "Jimmy, one dad think I should go to college," and he was like, "Oh fuck them." <laughs> No, that, that's, that's, that's what he is. I mean, yeah. He, he, yeah, he's a brilliant, brilliant businessman. I mean, he's making, first of all, his first business, Wine Library TV, was great. But you, but you said, I didn't know what you wrote in the book about that. You say it or not if you want, but I didn't know. Oh, that his father... Uh, he gave the it impression was, it was a large... Yeah what off license we call it an off license a large bottle shop not a bloody empire it wasn't an empire i mean in his father he made it out like it was like a like a liquor store he called it my father's yeah. liquor store that he yeah. turned into a multi-million dollar business it was a million dollar in in revenue a year warehouse which isn't a ton but it's a lot you know i mean he he, he had the luxury to work without and gave him a safety net to, yeah to, exactly to, to do one 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 thingy tv whatever. which i have no problem with but this was my whole thing this is why i consider it hype he speaks in these absolutes which is is, is what makes him a good hype artist and he turns himself into a guru so he this is a hype strategy and you should take this if you're listening dial up your strong um your strengths and dial down your weaknesses. Don't lie. So Gary Vaynerchuk could have gotten on there and said, you know, um, my I was really fortunate to have the cushion from my father. That being said, I worked hard and turned it into something new. Yeah, um, he did. Hard work is very important, but it's more than hard work. It's about building systems. And he wouldn't have become as big. What he said, not lying, he said, I turned my father's liquor store into a multi-million dollar business. Now it was a liquor store. It was just a million dollar a year liquor store. Um, hard work is everything. Hustle, hustle, hustle. Yeah, hustle is important. But what about all the other things you need? The ability to sell, the ability to raise capital, the, the right structures, the right team members. So what I'm saying is what makes him such a good hype artist is that he's turned himself into almost this cartoon. And you need to do the same. That doesn't mean lying. It means create a... a, a a showman version of yourself that almost takes the rough edges off people respond better to that so what i did was i i i, I called out some of this stuff and yes i don't i think that when someone bursts that bubble he's savvy enough to know that that hurts it that, that 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 hurts his image because right now what he gets paid the most for is being gary vaynerchuk you know he owns a digital agency i can't get anyone to tell me one campaign they've done that was a brilliant campaign that doesn't mean they don't exist but I think his paydays come from selling Gary V. So that hurt. So all of his followers started blowing up my phone and calling me an idiot and all of this. And I was really nervous. And then I started getting fans. And what I realized was that there's always other people who feel contrarian to some, yeah. something that's out there, but they don't have an organizing principle. So they started to follow me as the leader. And I realized that people get much more passionate when they're against something than when they're for something. So and I, yeah, so I started thinking in these terms, I'm like, I'm not going to play it safe anymore. I'm, I'm going to start thinking in this way. So I started looking at not only rock stars and, and rock managers, but like propaganda artists and cult leaders and all kinds of pranksters and saying, can I distill out the underlying elements and repurpose them for my own career? And I did. And I started to do you know, quite well. I mean, you say that throughout the book. You, you say, you know, hype's been with us throughout history. I mean, I mean, that's what you know. It's it's not. This is not. These aren't new principles. It's just that ability to work with them. I mean, like you say, historical figures that have used it are not always. I guess we don't always know both the good ones and the bad ones. I mean, one of the ones that I I thought was so interesting that you spoke about was um, Hubbard, 
just touch oh, on oh yeah yeah, yeah. Scientology yeah. Uh, Ron Hubbard because I I kind of knew that story but I didn't really like it was like he's, he's following a manifesto isn't he he's, he's, he's putting together a doctrine and you know you talk I mean, about that, that, that as that, well right that's right? another um hype tactic that I think again, I know you have all kinds of people who listen to you, but I feel like I run into more and more people who listen to podcasts who are sort of trying to sell their ideas, right? They're not trying mm-hmm. to sell, I don't know, physical products. The, the day of selling a ball bearing company, people still do that, but that's rare. A lot of the people who, who are trying to learn about business from podcasts, they're trying to become a consultant, a coach, a guru, a professional thought leader of some kind. And, and, and if you want to do that, A lot of people are like, I'm going to write a book. And then they wonder why they don't succeed after they write a book. It's because the books that really turn people into multi-million dollar gurus, they're not really books, they're Bibles. They promise to give you implicitly the answer to the universe. So seven habits of highly effective people. What that implies is that if you master these seven habits, that's all you need to become a highly effective person. And so I would think if you're going to go out and write a book or create some sort of manifesto or, or digital course or whatever you're doing, think in terms of, again, not lying, but frame things as this is the holy grail of changing your life. And, and you'll do, it'll just, the virality will, it it will just, that's a bad term these days. The spread will go a lot farther. The word of mouth will go a lot farther than if you You say that you say you've got to speak. It's like Vaynerchuk does it really quite well, I guess. Cause you, you said you have to speak like this is the problem. This is the only solution. This is the only solution. And you, and you say, you know, find that and, and, and you, know, you have to speak about it often. You have to repeat it and it has to be catchy. But that is what you say. You say, this is the solution that exists. It's almost like, it, it reminds me of, um, and this that you'll say just to the listeners and, and to the people watching this on YouTube as well, is that why me and Michael go on, because it's just, I'm off on one now, but it reminds me of, um, and the guy I learned this from was Henry Rollins. I love him, actually. Yeah, <laughs> love Henry Rollins. Henry Rollins behind the day talks about. Uh, he says you have to have what the LAPD call command presence. Right, exactly. And he's and it, and that is the comp- And I talk to um, kids about it, and I talk to them. Um, and when I'm training people to do social engineering, one of the things I say is I, I hate guard. Do- I come across guard dogs in my career, in my early career, because I'm breaking into buildings, right? So, legitimately, um, but I hate it. And, and like I, I asked, I had a special forces mate and I said yeah, I can't like I'm so scared of them you know I don't want to be run down and he said what you have to have is that complete certainty in your voice like you have to believe that there's no way it's going to argue with you like you have to exactly. believe that and then it doesn't use that whole smell fear thing I guess and it's come out and Henry Rollins says it's what the LAPD refers to as command presence you just have to own it now there's a way to do this without lying and saying your solution is the only solution when it's not. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that tough guy, Henry Rollins personality, and the Mm -hmm. way to do that is make it a practice of taking out qualifying words. So right. There's a guy named Ryan holiday. And I've noticed this recently. He's sort of this marketing guru, but also a really good writer. And he writes these um, blog posts and articles. And I noticed this recently. He says things like, like today, he said, If you, um, when you exercise, you will have a better day. And you're like, I got to exercise more. And then I think about it. I'm like, you will have a better day. Mm -hmm. You might have a better day. You will often have a better day. Ryan Holiday has better days, but he never writes that way. Now he'll never say the only thing to make your life better is exercise because that's a lie. But he speaks in this very, very authoritative way. And, and I'm convinced that the reason he does that is not because he feels that confident about everything he says. It's because he is a master, master marketer. And he knows that that's what will get people to follow you. It's conversational hypnosis. It's, it's embedded commands. That, you know, I, I, I mean, that's, you, you've got to, I mean, I, even when I teach negotiation, I sort of people taking anything, any qualifiers, out so you don't say can you do a bit better right you, you know how, you say how much better can you do and and it's the exact words that people use that are so persuasive and influential but 
people just don't. So what we talk about with negotiations, you don't go off script. So when you're trying to persuade an influence, you don't go script off script. Script is the best term. I just want to jump on that because I, when I used to hear things like this, because I'm a bit of a people pleaser by nature, right? Mm -hmm. And as a result, when people would say things like this, command present, this, and I would be like, I, I can't really do this. That's not me. And the point is you don't have to do it always. When you're in a certain situation, you're playing a role mm -hmm. and it's a function of practice. So that doesn't mean you have to go around barking at everybody you meet or that when you're home with your spouse or significant other, you need to, you know, use no qualifying words. Qualifying words can be useful. It's that when you're playing the role of authority, you need to practice that habit and it is learnable. It's in that specific circumstance. Not when you're trying to compromise. That doesn't mean when like someone says to you, hey, should we go out to dinner here? Or there you go. We're going to Thai food. It's like, well, that's, <laughs> no. no, I mean, you'll, you won't have any friends, right? That's not what we're talking about. Yeah. But it's, I think what it, what all of this implies and what that last bit really implies as well is that I think you've got to, it's a strategy and, and that, that requires planning and forethought and care around these moments and these times when you do need to be careful about what we say and the language that we use. And that's really what you're trying to do. I think, I think it's trying to say to people, it, these things don't happen by accident. Correct. You know, um, I'm not going to, like I say, I hate giving some eggs, but like tour buses don't break down in the middle of Chevalier Square. That's not always by accident, right? Oh, please give this story. No, oh, I mean, that's because yeah. I just, yeah. well, I mean, you give it your. I don't mind. I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, yeah, I mean, the, the idea, yeah, um, Jenny's alluding to um, a story I tell in the book about uh, Shep Gordon, who was Alice Cooper's manager. And what's so funny about that, he, he blundered into being their manager. He, he did not like their music. They were a weird band. Uh, it wasn't his style and none mm -hmm. of them were famous. He was like a, 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 a weed dealer who lived in the same hotel as them. <laughs> but because he didn't like their music, he, he considered it a challenge to make them famous anyway. So um, they, he had already, he created sort of the Alice Cooper shtick with the guillotines and the, the, the theatrical stuff on stage and, and all this cool stuff, but they were not big in the UK. They were big in, in, um, uh, in the US. And, and this was this, I guess the early seventies and he brought them to the UK and he talked his way into a deal with, with at Wembley arena and like three days before the show, 500 tickets were sold. So it was going to be a fiasco. Mm. So um, what he did was he paid off a guy to make sure that a truck broke down in Piccadilly Circus at rush hour. Yeah, yeah. And he put a billboard on the truck that showed Alice Cooper naked, but with a snake draped over his nether regions. So we'll find a shot and put that on. We'll put a picture of this on. Because... Yeah, and and so, and so, Chef Gordon's whole thing was that if parents hate Alice Cooper, kids will define themselves against their parents and love Alice Cooper. So everyone went crazy. They they brought it up in Parliament. They said this is a, you know, the the youth of, of Britain is being corrupted, et cetera, et cetera, and and um they sold out the arena and you know became one of. But of course they did. Events. Yeah, exactly. and it's that you know I found that so interesting as well. And there'll be people who um, I did a talk um, for Hacker Halted uh, this year, and it was called the Witch Ball and the Tribe, and and it was about you know part of it was about the way uh, occult principles influence social engineering, and and and, and you know that that the. the the, in fact, it's, we've sort of got two of your principles in that talk, actually, but partly it was the theatre. A cool, pre I want to listen to this. This is right It's up online. It's cool. online. I'll, yeah, I'll I haven't heard this one. I'll send you a link. Yeah. Partly it was the th witch ball was a, 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 like a horrible sort of made of dung and full of poison and thorns and things. And, and but the victim to have pieces of the victim's clothing on or a button or something, something that you've, you, I've lost a button, I can't find. You know, back then, when we're talking about like if you lost a button you would really notice that because you probably didn't have lots of clothes right and that button would turn up and what they do is they'd make sure that the victim found this witch ball so it, it would stink it'd be full of like irritant oh, plants wow. and things and it'd have some personal items and they'd, they'd make this thing up and then they'd 
get into the victim's house if they could and leave it under the pillow or in the middle of the kitchen. And my and the point about it was, and I was talking about social engineering is th- that has no power on its own, but it's the idea that someone is sort of deliberately right. um, going to a lot of trouble to kind of spook you. Um, so there's the theatre part of that. But the other part of that talk... I love that. Um, cool. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> but the other part of that was... Um, of the talk was about the tribe. And what I said was... And it was not... It sort of touched on the principle that you touched on, but it wasn't that principle. It was the idea that, you know, we, we want to be part of... We, we so want to be part of a tribe. You know, Alice Cooper's fans want to be part of our scoopers fans because their parents are against it and, and your brain just wants you to pick to, to you say it in the book your brain just wants you to pick a pick a side and i wonder whether you see that so much you know we see it in politics we see it particularly you know when everything's so divisive you, you nobody wants to sit in the fence really i guess is what i'm saying the the problem is or the i don't know if it's a problem but but the reality is no matter how enlightened we are, there's no avoiding this. So it's a function of admitting it to yourself. Uh, You know, um, I I mentioned a little bit of research in the book that that an anthropologist Mm. found with pretty compelling evidence that every human on earth descends from this little group of of homo sapiens (laughs) on the coast of South Africa who like, there were a lot of homo sapiens, but most of them died out from a climate change event. And this one little group retreated to this area where there was a bed of shellfish. So that's really good because you you don't have seafood. Easy, right? You don't have to hunt. (laughs) Yeah. I I mean, oysters, delicious. (laughs) But, but, you know, they didn't have to hunt for the woolly mammoth. It was all there was growing on the rocks or where, you know, there's like the the beds of of oyster, you know, really dense oyster beds. So it was very, it was like high calorie, easy to get. And superb brain food. Though. Yeah, super brain food, squirt a little uh, lemon on. Well, I don't think they had the lemon, but. <laughs> no, but it's um, really good brain food. Yeah, it's, it? it's great. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's, and they had nothing else. I mean, they, they, mm-hmm. pe- they're, 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 there was just mass extinction event going on. However, the only thing that kept them from getting this seafood, so the uh, theory goes, is other humans. So if you controlled this very small alcove, and another tribe came in and took it from you. That was a big deal. So basically, the highly um, backed up theory goes, those human beings who were able to simultaneously cooperate with people like them, mm-hmm. that they defined as being like them, while also hating people who weren't like them, survived while other people died off because they could collaborate with their group to guard the area and mm. knock out the other people. And, and then they spread out throughout the earth. So no matter how good we are, defining yourself against somebody or something else is a lot more emotional. Like you can say, um, I am a featherhead. That's what I'm going to call myself. And that's like big deal. But if your sports team is named named the featherheads and they're playing against other sports teams, sometimes that's like your defining characteristic, right? So, and it's, you know, well, I I I remember being in England, the arsenal, I saw a storefront window kicked in. I was there 20 something years ago. And I was like, why did this storefront window get kicked in there? Like arsenal just won. It was arsenal fans kicking in the window to celebrate. (sighs) It's just a sport. But, but you see that stuff everywhere. Like, well, they didn't win. But, but <laughs> their, you know what? I teams, speak about football team did. in that same lecture. So I don't want to talk about this, but it just. This no, is please you, do. It, yeah. there was, in that same lecture, I talk about this experiment in a place called Robbers Creek. And there were these two psychologists, and they just took a load of boys. And what they tried to do was get the, the demographic almost exactly to so the age, everything was almost exactly the same. So they got them. And they split them into two try with two groups put them there in this same um, i suppose we call it summer camp now you'd never get this through the ethics committee now i know well, yeah these experiments you, you wonder how the stanford prison experiment <laughs> all of these things prison. yeah how did they do this yeah um i when i look at that i'm surprised it lasted so long it took me so long anyway um but in robbers robbers cave robbers cave i think it was called and 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 so they put them in and they gradually let the boys know that there was another group, and there was not there was nothing else, nothing else um, 
at all to, to define it, just that there was another group. And, and spontaneously, they hated each other. And it got to the point where when they finally let them kind of mingle, they encouraged it at first. It, it was a married uh, couple of psychologists. I can't quite remember the name, but I'll flash it up. Um, and and uh, it, they did encourage at first a little bit of competition. So they played sort of competitive sports and things, but they had to stop it because there was food fights. There was raids on each other's uh, sleeping quarters. And it, it just was the real life Lord of the Flies immediately. And then the, what they found was... Um, and it, it's it, it's uh, it's it's been quoted over and over again. Is that there, there doesn't need to be a reason, my right? It, it does that. There it's doesn't. Just, no. You know, and then if you give them any reason, you'll get this violence. Actually, very very quickly, they found that the only way they they tried um, feeding them at the same time to see if you know breaking bread had kind of work. That didn't bring them together. And in the end, what they found. The only thing that they found, and I wonder whether this ties in as well, what you think about this, was that they um, they gave them a common enemy. A hundred percent. So so that's it. So they said to remember some unknown yeah. third party had attacked the water tank and then they just united. And this is I what actually, you say, right? I think that the reason the United States was unified you know the united states is not really one country it's many countries in one and like for example southern culture and northern culture are quite different mm -hmm. so but we had the nazis and the japanese and then the soviets for the better part of the 20th century so we were really united i don't think it's a coincidence that those old rivalries are coming back in such a strong way no. now that we don't have a dominant enemy you know um, but what, what I want to say is, you know, listening to this could sound very depressing. It's that like, we're going to just be at each other's throats. And, and I think for those people who listen to these kind of shows to, to apply things beneficially to their own lives, I mean, I think you can use these tendencies in a productive way. So it, it doesn't always have to be a person. You can pick a fight with an idea. So yes. um, there, there's a project management software company called Basecamp who picked a fight with the idea of over complexity in work. And they write all these books and articles about, you know, fire your workaholics when you're, when you're, when your client says jump, do not say how high mm -hmm. and, and their software is the perfect tool for delivering simplicity. So as a result, their software yes. base camp has almost a cult like following. So they're not hurting anybody quite the opposite but they've unified people around what could be a very boring thing, project management software, because they pick a fight with workaholic culture and with complexity and with bureaucracy. So there are ways to use these tendencies. I mean, that's what we do in, 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 our, in our agency. We'll find a client and the first question I ever ask the, the, the stakeholders in the company is, what is a point of view in your industry that is, that is gospel that you absolutely yeah. hate. That's you say, don't you say, find the sacred cow, slaughter it. That's what I it. do. Yeah. yeah. It's the, it, and it's, it's the key to coming up with a powerful point of view that people will rally around and pay you money for, if that's what you you're know, going for. Well, you know what, right? I mean, obviously we could talk about this for ages and I mean, I, I just can't recommend this. I mean, I was reading this and going, I've got those things. I think like that, but it, it it's like, some of it sounds so obvious, you know, of course, like, you know, find something, find these things and really talk about them you know I have solid things to back it up it sounds so obvious but I, I never even in my business I never looked at some of those things and thought well I can apply it that way and you're right, right. I don't mean to um to make it sound depressing but it's just that what you've got here is a, a real you call it a it's the hype handbook and it is a handbook for taking those principles and using it to elevate your ideas your business and it, I just honestly Michael I just thought it was brilliant and and I'm thinking that means I mean, a ton coming from you because I'm like huge fan of your work. Yeah. These and I looked and there was like some questions, but mostly it's me going, oh my God. So I'm, like <laughs> I just look in, I've got like six sigma exclamation mark because I was I used to work for GE. So we were taught all, right. all of those things. And 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 it's part, I mean, you mentioned that you mentioned Six Sigma and the way that that was like the answer to everything, and was it really? You know, so it's like I, I really thought. So, so Six true. Sigma, that's a great example because Six Sigma is great. It's a great thing. It's that, that's what I mean. These it, it, just because something is hyped doesn't mean it's empty. 
No. But they turned Six Sigma into like, you know, your plants are dying, Six Sigma. I mean, it was like it the, was, the gospel. Yeah. Honestly, I I mean, I, I you said there was, was it, uh, you said it was on Saturday Night Live and so on. 30 it, Rock. Yeah, in 30 Rock. They make fun of it. Saying, yeah. But I was, I, I, I trained, I was a green belt, right? So in Six Sigma, it was this, um, because I work for GA. Yeah, they and you, it, you had to do yeah. Six Sigma for yeah. GA, right? And it, it, basically what it was about was um, repeatability. So, so, so getting a process where you could, the process was so slick and so tight, it was repeatable. And, you know, I was in procurement at the time. Negoti- I was one of the um, a, a negotiator for them in, in Asia, mostly. So really, although I had to learn it, it didn't, I felt like it didn't apply, but I, I had to learn it. And so they would say to me, right. The trainers would say to me, so for Six Sigma, so in the factories and everything, it was brilliant. And the example they used to give was McDonald's and the amount of fries that went into every. So, you know, if you go, if you get a large fries at McDonald's, yeah. they have a, you'll see, they pick it up in like a chute and it's a specially made right. chute for McDonald's that will put within, I can't remember the number, but say it's something like, 28 fries is ideal. So it's that standardized, right? It's that sta- and 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 you can have 30. I didn't know that. 20, I know. You can have 30 yeah. or 27, but you can't have any more than that. And, and so it's standard stand because if you can make something repeatable, you can take cost out, you can take time out. I'm negotiating. So for me, I'm dealing with someone new. I'm dealing with people and persuasion and influence. Exactly. So when they tried to get that to apply to me, I could see how fantastic it was at so many things and going for perfection. But it didn't always deal with the, you know. Um, it was true. That, I mean, they yeah, they became too rigid with it, which is why it had shortcomings. However, the fact that it was able to be seen as such a cure-all. But is what just you amazing. say about it, but what yeah. you said about it, what you another piece of, of advice that you gave was absolutely true. So what they did, which was genius, was they said, now you have to go away and in four weeks time in order to get, and by the way, I had to like my bonuses and pay rise and everything depends on me getting the screen belt. And in four weeks time, you have, you have to go away. You have to do an experiment in your area. And then you come back and tell us how Six Sigma applies, which is genius because they're getting the client to do the work. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I found a way to, to do it, which was all of the research and the modeling that goes on before. So that at the table, you were free to work with the people and all the variables. So you Speaking know, of the occult, that's that's not science. That's a cult. That's like the because <laughs> science is falsifiable. So like ancient priests used to do, you know, they would burn incense and cast down sticks and this and that. And no matter what happened, the oracle had the answer because of the all of the ceremony they did. Mm-hmm. And humans aren't different. I mean, consultants actually call it eye candy and basically what they are is our modern priests they have charts and figures and you know rituals. math and, and yeah, rituals and mm-hmm. six sigmas and this and some of it's valuable but when you start to hear that something is completely unfailing you know that it's hype however you should do the same for example if you're going out giving good advice to people people will pay you considerably less than if you call it the Delta squared, six step, you know, um, process oriented, whatever. You can say the same thing, but if you put structures and names and colors and processes around it, the value and, and the addictiveness of it goes up. So it, that's a lesson to follow if you're selling. And, and you, and in this, you, like Michael gives, honestly, folks, you need to get, if you run a company or you're responsible for it. I mean, I'm thinking of a lot of the listeners of this are um, InfoSec people and part of their job is to promote security right. within an organization which is, is a difficult sell yeah you know my in the book it'll say say it this way you know fine it's it's not about um saying something that's wrong or or, or lying or, or it's not about it's not about taking nothing and making it into something it's it's about what what you've done in this is say i've got something there's something good something that needs to be more widely understood right. so these are the things that help you do that and i think it's a brilliant achievement i loved it and i really Thank highly you. recommend everyone goes and looks at this especially if you've got ideas to promote or even if you're just interested in in why some things even if you're interested in why a reality tv star um got to be the most powerful person in the world a I lot mean, yeah, of what no. goes on there 
that's how that happens now can you use it for good which is michael's message i think that's what i took away anyway that's the message thank you no i mean and and um you know i know we're getting close to the end but i just i have to say i'm so pleased that you know we initially just sort of met randomly because i was a fan of your show and and i want to write about it in some of my work and it was weird how we just, I, I feel like you're a friend and it wasn't that long ago that we met. We just hit it off. So this is just such a pleasure to sort of talk about this stuff with you. Oh no, it's brilliant. I loved it. So um, where can people find out more about you? Where can they follow you? We're going to, we'll obviously put all the links up, but where, where, where does that? Um, what can yeah. We- I mean, sure. Thank you for, for letting me plug myself in that way. No. I and mean, obviously the book is, um, you know, I mean, obviously if you can get it in a bookstore, that's great, but times are weird now. So it's on Amazon, it's on barnesandnoble.com. I know that Amazon UK is a little bit different. Um, It's coming out January 12th, as I said earlier, in hard copy in the US. I think it's on Kindle anywhere. Um, And and so, so, and you can pre-order. Two two great ways to find me online. One is michaelfshine.com, spelled S-C-H-E-I-N. Yeah, we'll put the link, we'll put the site up. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. And then microfamemedia.com is my company. Um, Another cool thing that I think is a lot of fun and something I'm very proud of, when I started researching all of this stuff, I found that the books I was reading, the best ones and the most helpful ones were also the most entertaining ones. They were biographies of of crazy characters and weird crowd psychology books. So I started sharing my recommendations and we've become a bit of a community. We're called the Hype Book Club. It's a lot of fun. And um, that's uh, hypereads.com slash list. I, again, I know it's a mouthful here on, on the air. We, we, we'll yeah. just run it. We'll run it as a, yeah. as a ticker. Yeah. But absolutely. that I have a whole lot of fun with. And um, and I did see, you know, at the back of the book, you know, that this really um, comprehensive bibliography with a lot of these things in. And like, you know, we've touched on certain things like the game. But I have to tell you that, you know, to unpick a lot of what Neil Strauss did in that book, you know, these are things that social, if you're interested in social engineering at all and how it works and some of the psychology that I use in my job, you need to read Hype Handbook and then go and read up more on things like the game because it was very interesting that the way the way those guys worked and, and for, you know, you've kind of touched on it and there's all the bibliography of all that as well. So it's really a good resource for it, Mike, it, it is. And you bring up a good point because... A lot of times I'll I'll hear, I got fired from Forbes because they didn't like that I wrote about pickup artists and about the nation of Islam because they Mm -hmm. said that people are sensitive to it now. And that's all well and good. And I'm not advocating for it. However, you can make a decision that you want to be victim to this stuff or you want to learn from it and apply it to good. And to do that, you need to face reality a little bit and study even people that you disagree with. Again, that's up to you, but I, I, my personal opinion that is it's important to, even if you don't like what, what they use the game for and pick up artists, if you want to learn about social engineering, what better social engineering is there than that? And well, well, ju- I mean, just if people have not, I'll give you one example from the game that, sh- that shows like, the, because he was undercover journalists, uh, you, you know, he was there to investigate. Oh, as a well, journalist, right? As an upper journal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. he was there to investigate how, you know, the world to pick up artists. And then he got kind of drawn into it because it's, it, you know, these, this is, these are potent drugs, these things. The influence is a potent drug. If you learn to do it, it can be very, uh, you know, something that's hard to kind of drop. Yeah. And the bit in there that, that, that really sort of sold it to me was, he, he, in his role as a journalist, yeah, and this, I might have to edit this over, we might not have time. But I, I'm speaking to you now. In his role as a journalist, and nothing to do with the pickup part of story that he was now kind of living his life as. Yeah. A little bit like you when you were in the band and wearing the clothes and everything. Yeah. Um, he, he, he was supposed to interview Britney Spears. And she was in a bad mood and, and she was giving him nothing, one word answer. She was sick of journalists and everything. So he used game on her, he used the formula. <laughs> The pickup artist for me on Britney Spears. And he describes how he started to, you know, he did all the tactics. So you, there's things like flattery, there's things like um, 
it's sort of like an anti-attention uh, thing. Like that, the neg, negging, they call it, right? Negging, you, yeah. right? So, so you what? You, so you isolate, for example, um, and this this actually works really well if you're working with a group of people. You've got an alpha, and and if you learn how to body language and things, you can learn how to identify someone who's at least perceived as the alpha in that context. And and they, what they do is they they neg, they ignore the most attractive female yeah, yeah, in their right, opinion like, right. and, and then focus on other people now that might not be comfortable to read but right. you know if you're that's you would should know people should know that that's how these yeah. things work that you know that we are very easily manipulated and god knows we can tell that we are by the state of the world today and so, he didn't do it to get to, to get Britney Spears into bed. That's the thing. No, he, he wasn't did trying to, to do that at all. He just wanted to. That's the you. point, right? Because it's not, it wasn't about romantic. He used romantic seduction techniques to get a great interview. But here's the thing as well with that is, is um, what, and one of the problems, not that I don't have a massive problem with people who sack you, I do as a friend, but one of the they problems do is, I don't have a problem with people who sacked you. Oh, oh sacked. You know, obviously, but I kind oh, of I don't do, have a problem. In, I mean, it, it wasn't but my job. Mi- they but basically they're misinterpreting just, yeah. the yeah, and um, the po- romantic seduction. It's not really about romantic seduction, or the romantic part is far down the line. It's just seduction, seduction. and people people need to understand that you can you can draw someone in with no sort of romantic intent at all using those things use it well it's psychology it's anthropology it's all the things that go into this book it's linguistics it's it's belief. we seduce people all day long i mean we seduced each other there's nothing romantic yeah. about it but when you get someone to to like you and want to help you out it's, it's what not you a, said as well it's faders yeah. it's, it's like so you know you're ramping up the things that the, the things that create rapport you damp down the things that don't create rapport that's what people do and that's really what business is about it's what we should be trying to use so i see this as a, a brilliant i mean it was completely 100 percent my pleasure to talk to you about this mike as you can see folks me and michael talk for I mean, it's in a way it's probably a good thing that we have this huge time difference otherwise we, I, I don't know we'd be talking into exactly. the really small hours um so thank you for letting us interview you so early i'm sure this is going to go on to be huge um thank you jenny that i couldn't recommend this more highly i really couldn't to the point where i kind of almost don't want to put this out because i don't want people to read it i don't like and because oh no no don't say that it's true (laughs) (laughs) so anyway for now and thank you so much for such a brilliant interview thanks for being a guest on the human factor michael shag thanks for having me jenny